in this video, I thought we'd have a bit of fun talking about these bizarre divergent series that have really captured the imagination of the, the, the YouTube mathematical community the past couple of years. And uh, from my point of view, uh, this really became popular and became the topic of conversation uh, when Numberphile came out with that video saying that the, the sum of counting numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on, in a sense, sums to minus 1 over 12. Now, this is something that's been known for at least uh, 150 years, that something like this can be done. But th this has really come to the public's attention quite recently. And uh, what I thought I'd, I could contribute to this whole discussion, since a lot has been said about this, uh, one thing I thought I could contribute to this is give you an example of this technique that is continually referred to in some of these videos, which is called analytic continuation. And uh, I was quite pleased to see uh, that the, the mathologer, I think it was maybe one or two weeks ago, came out with a video which uh, gave a more rigorous treatment of such series, uh, more rigorous compared to what Numberphile did. And he actually uh, talked about this technique quite a bit. And uh, what I thought I could do, in addition to what he, could, what he did, was uh, give you an example of the, the mechanics behind analytic continuation, uh, actually write out some of the math. And I'd like to write out the math in the special cases of the, the Grandy series, which is this famous divergent series, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 and so on, and show you how we can assign a value of 1 half via this technique of analytic continuation. And through analytic continuation, we can also assign a value to this also very mysterious diverging series, 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 plus 5 and so on. And the value that gets assigned to that is 1 fourth. Now, to make sure everyone's on the same page, I'd like to do a quick review of uh, geometric series. Uh, the one that most people learn about in either calculus or before is the following series. Uh, we start out at 1, we add 1 half, then I add a quarter, then I add an eighth, and I continue out this process to infinity. And then in calculus, we learn that the value 2 gets assigned to this infinite series because this series converges to 2. That is, in the, the limiting sense, the sequence of partial sums converges to 2. Now, what's going on in this series? We have this first term here. We have some first term. And then each of the successive terms, the 1 half, the 1 fourth, the 1 eighth, is generated by multiplying the term that came just before by some number. In this case, that number happened to be 1 half. That is, I start at 1, the first term. To get the next term, I multiply by half. To get the next one, I multiply 1 half by 1 half. Then I multiply 1 fourth by half again to get the next one, and so on. And this special number is called the common ratio. And I'll notate this by r, which I think most people do. And I'll also notate this first term of the series by a naught, which I think most people do as well. And so in the abstract, we can say that the general form of a geometric series begins with some initial term called a naught. As I said, the next term is generated by multiplying the previous by r. So the next term in this case is going to be a naught times r. The next one is going to be formed by multiplying this one by r. So I got a naught r times r again. So, I get, so that gives me a naught r squared. And the next one is going to be a naught r cubed and so on. Hopefully you can see the pattern. And then uh, it's, we commonly learn too that if this thing converges, if this series converges, which happens only when the absolute value of r is less than 1, and we can see why it converges in this case because r was equal to 1 half, the absolute value of 1 half is 1 half, and 1 half is indeed less than 1. So if this geometric series converges, which is going to happen when the absolute value of r is less than 1, it's going to converge to a very specific form formula. And I'll give you a quick derivation of that, since it's very easy to derive. So I'm going to call the thing that this series goes to, converge to s. And then I make the key observation that if I multiply s by r, I multiply both sides by r, 
I get the following series. So I'm going to multiply every term by r. So that means the first term of this new series is going to be a naught r. Then the next one's going to be a naught r squared plus a naught r cubed, and so on. And then you'll notice I wrote them uh, with the columns matching up like that, because what I'm going to do next is subtract both sides of the equation. So I'm going to subtract the left-hand side. I get s minus sr is equal to. Now on the right-hand side, all of these columns will cancel out, and the term that's left is simply a naught. And now what I can do is factor out the left-hand side, factor out that s, and I get s times the quantity 1 minus r is equal to a naught. And then that implies that if the geometric series converges, the thing that it converges to, called s, is going to be given by a naught divided by 1 minus r. The other piece of machinery that I'd like to quickly review would be the Taylor series. And now this is a very familiar topic if you know some calculus. And recall that if I have some function, let's say f of x, just to give it a name, the Taylor expansion at 0, let's say the Taylor expansion at x equals 0, is going to be given by the following equation. f evaluated at 0 plus f prime, the first derivative evaluated at 0, times x plus the second derivative, f double prime at 0, times x squared over 2 factorial. And then the third derivative, evaluated 0, times x cubed, divided by 3 factorial, and so on. Each term has the form the nth derivative, evaluated 0, times x to the n, divided by n factorial. That's the Taylor expansion at 0. Now, suppose I wanted to expand out a function at some other value, uh, different than 0. Let's see, I call that value c. c just saying for some constant. Then we say that f of x is going to be given by f evaluated at c plus f prime at c times x minus c. This is the, the adjustment that you have to make to x minus c plus f double prime at c minus times x minus c, all squared over 2 factorial, and so on. Now each term is going to have the form the nth derivative at c times x minus c to the nth power divided by n factorial. And this is really the Taylor series plus some stuff about geometric series is really all the, the machinery that I'm going to need to, um, to talk a little bit about analytic continuation here. So now let's get back to that Grandy series, which is that 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so forth. Now, it suffices to say that I can't sum this in the usual sense, which in the usual sense would be to find the limit of the, the sequence of partial sums. Now, the sequence of partial sums would be given by 1. I start with 1 here, which I've written here, and I subtract 1, which gives me 0. 1 minus 0 is 0. Then I add 1 right back, so I get 1. Then I've got to subtract it again, so I get 0. And there's no particular, well, there is a pattern, 1, 0, 1, 0, but this doesn't go to a limiting value. So in the conventional sense, I can't sum this series, which means that if any meaningful value is going to be attached to the series at all, it has to be derived through some sort of abstraction. And the abstraction I'm going to use here isn't too radical, actually. It's just going to be a bunch of very simple observations about this series, and about the number 1, actually. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to rewrite this series. I'm going to keep the 1 right there. But I also know that 1 raised to any power is 1. So what I could do here in these powers is just mess around with them a little. Now, there's a 1 power in all of them right now. Let's suppose I change, let me write the 1 there in the next term. But suppose I changed that 1 from a 1 to a 2. So instead of just 1, I write 1 squared. So, so far I have 1 minus 1, 1 to the first power plus 1 squared. 
Now suppose I change that one from the one right there to cubed. Now this is still equal, right? Minus one cubed. And hopefully you can see the pattern of what I'm trying to do here. I have plus one squared minus one cubed plus one to the fourth power and so forth. So we could say that this might be like the, the first level of abstraction that we that we uh, that we see here. Now the second level of abstraction I'm going to uh, impose here is notice that the one gets repeated in every single term here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to view this series as a special case of a function of a function which is going to be I'm going to plug in the value x equals one to that function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to view the series as a special case of the function one minus x to the first power plus x squared minus x cubed plus x to the fourth and so on. So that this series can now be viewed as a special case. When x takes on the value 1. Now I should put a little question mark next to that because this in the usual sense can't be evaluated at 1 since it's a, it's a diverging series. But this is the, the abstraction that I'm going to uh, I'm going to impose here. Actually get rid of that equal sign. Hopefully nothing radical uh, appears to have been done so far. But wh what I'm going to do next is I'm going to uh, essentially cover my tracks. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to just, we're going to philosophize a bit about the following function, about that function I just got from that abstraction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define f of x as the function 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed plus x to the fourth and so on, the alternating geometric series. And we're going to uh, philosophize about this a little bit. Now, as I say, this is a geometric series. So uh, one question to ask when uh, observing this series is what's that common ratio going to be? What is that value of r going to be? That is to say, which value gets multiplied by each term to generate the next? And hopefully you can see that, that value is going to be minus x. That is, I start with uh, 1. I multiply by negative x to get negative x. I multiply 1 again by negative x to get x squared. Multiply by negative x to get negative x cubed, and so on. And hopefully it's obvious that a naught, that first term, is going to be 1. Now the next thing to, uh, to analyze here would be, for what values of x does the following infinite series converge? Since it's geometric, I know it converges when the absolute value of r is less than 1. I know r to be minus x, so minus x, the absolute value of minus x, has to be less than 1. Now, the absolute value of the negative of something is equal to just the plain old absolute value. Negating something doesn't change the absolute value. So I get the following condition, that the absolute value of x has to be less than 1, which is another way of saying that x has got to be located between minus 1 and 1. Now, let me draw this out, since the, the pictures are going to become a little bit important. So suppose this is the number line. I'm going to mark 0 right there. I'm going to mark 1 right there, and minus 1 over here. Now, how would I draw this interval of convergence? I would draw out the interval from here at minus 1, extending to over here at plus 1. That is to say, anything located between those uh, blue parentheses, any x value, any value on this number line, can be plugged into this function f of x, and I can obtain a value, not including minus 1 and not including 1. So that's the careful thing we have to do there. We can't include 1, and we can't include minus 1, because those are diverging. Now the next thing to ask is, suppose I plug in one of these values in this interval. Another way of writing the interval would just be minus 1 to 1. Suppose I plug in something in this interval. How do I obtain the value? Now you can't sum up infinitely many terms uh, in actuality, but you use your calculus knowledge, you use your knowledge of, diver of, uh, of a geometric series, we found that formula that the sum 
of a geometric series is given by the first term, a naught, divided by 1 minus r. And r is minus x, so I get 1 minus minus x, which is equal to 1 over 1 plus x. Which is to say, if you select your x to be in this interval, in minus 1 to 1, plug it into f, f of x is going to be equal to 1 over 1 plus x when the absolute value of x is absolute value of x is less than 1. To summarize, there's our f of x written out once again. And what we found was that under the condition that the absolute value of x is less than 1, and here's the picture drawn out once again, that, that interval where the absolute value of x is less than 1, we found that f of x is equal to 1 over 1 plus x. Now there's quite a bit more to say about this. One thing to recognize here is that this interval of convergence is going to be the domain under which f of x makes sense. So this region here, where the absolute value of x is less than 1, is the domain of f at this point. Since anything outside this interval makes no sense thus far. We, we've attached no meaning to it thus far. Now, another very important thing to observe here, let me just write, out, write that out once again, is that in addition to knowing the function values in this domain, we also know quite a bit more about this function. We also know, and this is important from the, from the calculus point of view, we know all the derivatives. I claim we know all the derivatives of x when x is in this domain, when the, when the absolute value of x is less than 1, that we know all the derivatives. And this is just by, given by the simple fact that when we have some radius of convergence of this, we have some interval of convergence here, that the derivative also takes on that interval of convergence. Or another way to put it is even more simply put, we can just plain old calculate the derivative here. I'm going to rewrite this as 1 plus x to the minus 1. f prime of x is given by, just using the power rule, negative 1, negative of 1 plus x to the minus 2. Second derivative is given by the following, 2 times 1 plus x to the minus 3. And there's nothing stopping us from calculating any derivative of any point in this interval. And uh, from a more philosophical point of view, I guess you can say that this sort of thing ought to make sense because we know all the function values in this domain. And what are you doing when you calculate a derivative? You're taking two function values, which are very close together, and you're dividing by delta x. So if we have all the information already, it kind of makes sense that we should be able to calculate any derivative here. And this observation that we have tons of information already is going to allow us to analytically continue f. That is, it's going to allow us to extract even more information from this function, and it's going to allow us to push this domain upon which f makes sense to a larger domain. And the way in which we're going to extend the domain under which f might make sense is through the Taylor series. And this is actually going to be very simple, but it's, it's going to, I hope it's going to stun you, since it's, it's just one of these remarkable properties about Taylor series that something like this works at all. And we're going to do something very simple, which is we're going to take f and we're going to Taylor expand it at x equals 1 half. So we're going to find the Taylor series at x equals 1 half, which certainly can be done. We know anything you'd want to know from the calculus point of view at x equals 1 half because it's within that interval of conversions. We know the function value. We know f of 1 half. We know all the derivatives at 1 half. So there's really nothing stopping us from running out this Taylor series. So what we're going to do is do precisely that. We're going to write out Taylor series. So the first term of Taylor series is going to be f evaluated at 1 half. The next term. It's going to be f prime at 1 half times x 
minus a half. Remember, that's the correction factor we have to add. Plus second derivative at one half times x minus a half squared over two factorial, and so on. Each term is going to be the nth derivative at one half times x minus a half to the nth power over n factorial. And just to give this whole thing a name, it's a function of x. Uh, let me just call it g of x. But look at what we're doing here. We're using our information that we know about the derivatives at one, at one half to predict the values near x equals one half, which is really what you're doing with the Taylor series. You're using the information you know at a single point about the function value and its derivatives to predict other function values, to estimate other function values. Here I've just uh, moved things around just to make a little bit more space. I have g of x here, which I gave as the, the Taylor series expansion of f at x equals 1 half. And now what I'm going to do is simply calculate these derivatives at 1 half. So let's start with f of x, which is 1 plus x to the minus 1. We see that f of 1 half is going to be 1 plus a half, which is 3 halves to the minus 1. So I'm going to get 3 halves to the minus 1. And I'm not going to simplify just to make things a little bit clear, to make the pattern clear. So the g of x, first term is going to be 3 halves to the minus 1. And then let's find f prime of 1 half. So f prime of x is going to be minus 1 plus x to the minus 2. And plugging in 1 half, I get minus, I get the 3 halves again, to the minus 2 power. So let me write that in. I get the minus, notice I get a sign flip here, the minus 3 halves to the minus 2 times x minus a half, just copying that in there. Now let's find f double prime of x. That's going to be given by, just move that negative 2 down, so it's going to become a positive 2, 1 plus x to the minus 3. And then f double prime at 1 half, it's going to be 2 times 3 halves to the minus 3. Let me copy that in there. Plus, notice I get the sine flip once again. 2 times 3 halves to the minus 3 times x minus a half squared over 2 factorial. And now, well, let me calculate one more term, the third derivative. So f triple prime at x is going to be Move that negative 3 down. Now notice what happens here. I get minus 3 times 2. And I write it like that, not just 6, because you can see every time that one of these comes down, I'm going to get things that look like 3 times 2, or the fourth derivative is going to be 4 times 3 times 2, which suggests the factorial, that the factorial is going to start to develop here. So I get minus 3 times 2 times 1 plus x to the minus 4. So the, the next term is going to be minus, I'm going to write it down here, minus 6, which I claim is really because of the 3 factorial, times 3 halves, once again, to the minus 4 times x minus a half to the third power over 3 factorial. And I made a business of writing those, those factorials because in each term, we're going to get a claim we're going to get a cancellation, even if you extend it to higher order terms. And now, let me clear everything up, and then we're going to see what we get when the dust settles. So here I have the series g of x just written out more cleanly. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to recognize that this is a geometric series, lo and behold. And it, it is also, lo and behold, an alternating geometric series. And now let's uh, 
apply our usual analysis to the geometric series. Uh, first of all, what is that common ratio going to be? What is that term that, that multiplies the, the previous term to get the next? So I notice here, going from this term to this term, I need a minus sign. I also need a 3 halves to the minus 1 power to, increase, to uh, make that power more negative. So you get minus 3 halves to the minus 1. And then I have to stick in an x minus 1 half. So times x minus a half. And hopefully you can see that this is the correct common ratio. Now, let me just write that out as uh, minus 2 thirds, a little bit more naturally, minus 2 thirds times x minus a half. That's equal to r. And now we ask, we have, okay, we have this infinite series here, but when does this thing actually converge? And let's check. It's going to be when the absolute value is less than 1. Now the absolute value of negative 2 thirds times x minus a half has got to be less than 1. Now I just use the rule that I can get rid of the negative. So I get 2 thirds times x minus a half. is less than 1. And now what I'm going to do is use another property of the absolute value, which is I can break up terms which are being multiplied. That this thing is equal to the absolute value of 2 thirds times the absolute value of x minus a half. Still got to be less than 1. Now the absolute value of that is just plain old 2 thirds times the absolute value of x minus a half. Is less than 1. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by 3 halves. I get a cancellation over there. So I'm going to get x minus half absolute value is less than 3 halves. Now what does this mean in terms of a, an interval? Now if you do the absolute value thing, you'll find that x has got to be between, on the left, it's going to still be minus 1, as we found before. But lo and behold, on the right-hand side, it is 2. Now, hopefully this is quite stunning. Since what we've done here, and notice there's no trickery here. This is just Taylor expansion. This is just plain old calculus. There's none of these uh, addition tricks or anything like that. This is just plain old calculus and analyzing the derivatives of a function, lo and behold, when finding the Taylor expansion, we found that this thing makes sense for values between minus 1 and 2. So let's draw that out up here. So I'm going to write in that 2 right there. And now I'm going to highlight the interval here. So on the left, we still have minus 1, just as before. But we've pushed the domain of g past this blue parentheses into the red parentheses, which gives us more values. It gives us the value of g at 1 and some more values between 1 and 2. Now, in the language of analysis, we say that g is the analytic continuation. Analytic because we're using analysis. We're using the analysis power series. And it's a, it's a continuation because it includes all the values, all the function values of f, but adds a few more. But adds a few more. It pushes that domain a little bit further. And I'm going to show you that in this red interval, which corresponds to g, everything in this interval also can be evaluated to 1 over 1 plus x. Here I've moved some stuff around one more time. Uh, I've just changed those minus exponents to the positives, and I've flipped the three halves into two thirds, but it's the same series. Still have g. A naught, in this case, that first term is going to be two thirds, which is right there. And again, that r, the common ratio, is going to be negative two thirds times x minus one half. Now, remember we had that formula for the sum of a geometric series. 
which is going to be the first term minus two thirds, or sorry, positive two thirds over one minus r. So I'm going to have one minus minus two thirds times x minus a half. And I'm just going to change those to plus signs. Now to simplify, I multiply both top and bottom by three halves. I get the cancellation on the top, so I get one on the bottom. I have one times three halves, so I get three halves. And then the two thirds cancels with the three halves, so I'm left with plus x minus a half. Simplifying, get one over three halves minus a half is two over two or one. So on the bottom, I get, lo and behold, one plus x. What you notice is the same thing as what f was giving me. So I can say that when g converges in that red interval there, that g converges to 1 over 1 plus x, which is precisely the thing that f converged to for its appropriate values. And at this point, we're ready to return to the Grandy series, which is that 1 minus 1 plus 1, which I remind you, I viewed f as the more abstract case and the Grandy series as a special case when x equals 1 and x equals 1 in quotation marks. And now we know that g of x actually makes sense when x equals 1 because x equals 1 is contained within that red interval there. So that means that g of 1 is perfectly well defined. In fact, it's defined through a, a converging geometric series. And if you were to write this thing out, you'd find that g of 1 can be calculated in the following way. 2 thirds minus 2 over 3 squared plus 2 over 3 cubed minus 2 over 3 to the fourth, and so on. And that's after doing some calculation. You get the following geometric series, which converges. And you can find that this thing converges to 1 half. So you can see here that instead of going, when looking at the Grandy series, going right for the calculator and seeing that, okay, let's do 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on, you can use your powers of abstraction to predict what its value ought to be if we're going to use some calculus techniques by calculating a different converging geometric series, namely this one. Because notice uh, when x equals 1 here, I have f of 1. If f of 1, like, no, that should be in quotation marks because that doesn't really make any sense, is equal to 1 minus 1 plus 1, and so on, that this diverging series is linked to that number through analytic continuation, which I call AC, through this process of using your calculus knowledge to push the, the domain over which the original series made any sense to a larger domain, where it does actually make some sense. So I claim that this is really the most important reason why these, uh, these summation techniques are justified. This is the, the real reason why we're allowed to substitute one half when we see the Grandy series. Now those other techniques are useful too, like the, the, the fancy summation techniques, where you have some like uh, some addition tricks, but this is probably the most conceptually elegant reason why this series can be associated to the number one half. So hopefully that made some sense, that when we write things like this, like the Grandy series, one way to view this is through the lens of calculus. And when we use this, this notation, this equal sign, we really mean that this thing can be abstracted first, and then that thing can be analytically continued to assign a value of one half through a series which does converge, or it could in principle converge. Now, we should keep using this equal sign notation, even though it's not really you know, equals, because I could play the same game with not that function that I wrote, which was 1 minus x plus x squared, and so on. 
but a different function too. There are lots of other functions that I could have analytically continued. I could have played the same game with, which would give me the Grandy series, and that they can be analytically continued to assign one half. For example, I could have used this series, one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, and so on. And I could have dealt with the value of x equals minus one. So if you plug in minus one into this, you get the Grandy series. And this, if you play the same game that I just played, you will also find that it's one half. So there is a, there is a sense of uh, consistency with this analytic continuation business that it, it doesn't seem to matter which function you abstract this thing to, but it's, they, they will all be analytically continued to one half, it seems. Now, I, put, I would put a, a question mark on that last statement since my knowledge of complex is, analysis is, isn't that deep, but you can see, at least experimentally, there are a few functions which can be analytically continued to one half, and I encourage you to play around with this a little bit. I'd like to wrap up this video by talking about one more series other than the Grandy series. And let me return back to f as I defined it. And we found that this alternating geometric series was equal to 1 over 1 plus a half in the region where it made sense, which was when the absolute value of x is less than 1. Now, I'm going to play another little trick here. Now I'm going to differentiate term by term. So I get f prime of x is equal to the derivative of 1 is 0, derivative of negative x is minus 1, plus x squared, take the derivative, that's 2x, then I get minus x squared plus x to the third, and so on. So I took the derivative of that side, I'm going to take the derivative of this side as well. And we found that the derivative is minus 1 over 1 plus x, all squared. And I claim that the interval over which this makes sense is also when the absolute value of x is less than 1. And now we use our power of abstraction, or the, the power of analytic continuation, however you want to put it, to extend this domain. And it turns out this can be extended to include the value uh, x equals 1, or to assign a value when x equals 1. And if you notice that when I plug in x equals 1, I get the following series. Minus 1 plus 2 minus 3 plus 4 minus 5 and so on. And then on the right hand side, when you do this whole analytic continuation business, you're going to get a, a conversion geometric series in principle, or maybe not a geometric series, but some conversion series, which you can actually calculate. But it's always going to give you this formula back. And that's going to be minus 1 over 1 plus 1, just plug in 1 there, squared. And I get minus 1 over 1 plus 1 which is 2, squared is 4. And then on the left-hand side, I get the same thing. And if I just negate both sides, I get the series 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4, and so on, is equal to 1 fourth. And of course, maybe I should write analytically continued for can be associated, this thing can be associated with one fourth, but that's an alternative uh, derivation of the, the value that can be assigned to this diverging series. And I think that'll wrap it up for this video. Uh, hope you had some fun in this video, and hopefully I've uh, contributed a little bit to this uh, discussion of attaching a value to these diverging series. And if you like my, my content, feel free to subscribe to my channel, and hopefully uh, you'll stay tuned for more videos. Thanks for watching. Just kidding, I'm not yet done, because it would be a sin to not at least mention this in this video. Let's go back to f, and what I'd like to challenge you to try doing is analytically continuing this to include the value x equals minus 2. And I'd like you to try playing the same game on that number line. We had uh, 0 there, minus 1, and 1. We had that initial interval. Uh, try playing the same game 
with the real number line, and you're going to run into a problem. So I'd like you to notice what the problem is, why the problem is coming up, and I'd like you to solve it. So think of how we're going to do this, how you're going to use the, the power series and like Taylor expansion and that stuff, how you're going to include minus 2 to assign a value to that, which corresponds to this wildly divergent series, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, and so on. So if you already know the answer, uh, prove why it's the answer, and if you don't know the answer, discover it. Now I'm done.